everybody. I'm Brian Mallow, and this is But Seriously. I'm Brian, I'm Brian Mallow, as it says right there. And this is But Seriously, as it says over there. Uh, so, if you know me, you know that uh, something I'm very excited to do every summer is go to the Lindau Nobel Laureate meeting. You'll hear me talk about it frequently. Um, and in a couple months, uh, you might hear a lot more about it as it comes up this summer um, after two years of being virtual. So the Lindau Nobel Laureate meeting is this great event in Germany where they bring a bunch of Nobel laureates and hundreds, five, six hundred young scientists from around the world, 85 to 100 different countries can be represented. And they're there for a week of mentorship and connecting Educating, inspiring, and connecting uh, comes from their logo. And I go there and I interview young scientists and Nobel laureates. And a few years ago, in fact, the last time it was in person, three years ago, uh, I really had a lot of fun conversations. But one of the most fun was on a topic that you might not think Hopefully, if you tuned into this, then maybe the topic sounded intriguing, but maybe everyone doesn't get as excited about the idea of, of what's inside a proton, what's inside a nucleus, what's going on in there, what is a proton, what is matter, what is energy. Um, but, you know, I'm the kind of person that does get excited by that sort of thing, <laughs> and so is my guest. So let me introduce you to Maria Zurich. Hi, Maria. Hello. Good to see you again. Good to um, see you again, too. <laughs> and and so much has changed. It's been about three years, and you moved on from being a postdoc at Berkeley National Lab. Um, and for those who don't know, that means that uh, after you get your PhD, after all the years you put in to, your PH, to, to work up to a PhD, um, kind of like medical doctors have in residencies and stuff, there's a period where the next thing you do is get a postdoc position, right? Right. And uh, and that can be a couple years, and it's a real job, it's a working position, um, but after that expired, she got a new job, and she moved from California to Illinois, where she works at Argonne National Lab, and uh, she's a nuclear physicist, who uh, is particularly interested in the proton. In fact, I noticed, I should have done a screenshot of this. I like what you wrote on your, uh, on your um, Twitter profile. And you wrote, uh, putting the pro in proton structure and fun and fundamental science. <laughs> that exactly, is there you go. Maria so Zurich. Two things which actually describe me very well, right? I yeah. think that I'm interested in proton structure and I also I also have lots of fun with science and I hope uh, that, you know, through, through my work and through science communication, uh, I can also bring this fun to others. Yeah, I think you do a really great job of it. That's your Twitter handle, Maria K. Zurich. Um, but easy to find it. You have a website at, at mariazurich.com, don't you, as well? I okay. do, I do, yes. So, um, well, Maria, thanks. Uh, and thanks for bearing with me as we had a couple of little technical glitches uh, this morning. But you must be used to that because you work with incredibly complicated machinery. Nothing like what we're talking about here. A little software, a laptop, two monitors. Um, but you work with incredibly complicated machinery, and it's like the biggest machines ever built to probe the smallest things we know about. That is really fascinating, isn't it? That to really look into this, what's deep, deep inside the matter, which is building all of us, we have to build such a huge machines to really, you know, probe it and study it. Study it. Yeah, so I work, I work, I'm a nuclear and particle physicist. It's sort of, you know, in between the division, sometimes a bit artificial. And here you can see the um, one of the experiments I work with. Um, Where is this? So is as, this there at Argonne in, in the Chicago area? 
this is a uh, the relativistic heavy ion collider which is located in the other national lab in brookhaven national lab is close to new york and this is the place um you can see you know the size of buildings for example right or trees somewhere there so this is the uh, accelerator and particle collider where we accelerate uh, particles like for example protons or a bit heavier ions like gold ions almost to the speed of light and we are smashing them um and one can ask okay why why you're doing it yeah <laughs> you heard probably you heard probably you know um about particle physicists at maybe at cern in europe right. you know smashing particles here in the us the relativistic heavy ion collider is currently the only working uh proton proton high energy proton proton and also ion ion uh, collider and we are doing all of this to look inside it is a one can think about it like a huge microscope right when we want to see something very small but not with our eyes and light which is reflected um but in a bit different way through uh different types of interactions not electromagnetic interactions but through through interactions which bind everything um, which builds us, this sort of visible matter, you know, this is what we can touch, it's all this visible world which is around, so-called strong interactions, which are binding everything what's inside, what's inside the proton. You know, so this is basically, yeah. Yeah, I think, so so, I, I I think a lot that, of people yeah. are familiar with the Large Hadron Collider in the Geneva right. area. And similarly, what you're showing there, there are actually two circles and that's all underground, right? The tunnels are underground? So, uh, they are, I mean, it doesn't have to be underground. So some of the some of the accelerators are underground. Some are just sort of uh, shielded. So it really, it really depends. Um, what's important here is that you could see that you have sort of several different circles, right? You see the blue circle and the green circle oh, yeah. and then the uh, yellow and the blue. Um, so the point is that, of course, if you want to achieve this very, very high energies or, you know, very, very high speeds of the particles which you are smashing with each other, um, it's sort of a process, right? So first we produce these particles in a source and then step by step, we are accelerating it to higher and higher energy. So it's not just that, you know, we have the beam and we just shoot it inside the one accelerator and everything works and it's um you know <laughs> as high highly energetic as we want but it's really a process right so you slowly slowly push these particles a bit step by step and then you inject them to this main big rings which you can see there's like there was like a blue ring and the yellow ring and they are running there like crazy uh in the benches so these are not like continuous beams but they are like small uh, benches of particles, and then we are uh, just smashing them in the particular places. So you can see, for example, where it's written star. So this is the uh, detector or experiment I work with. This is the place where these two beams of, uh, of protons have a chance to smash against each other. Um, and this is where fun starts right where we can detect everything from these collisions uh in huge uh detectors one can say detector maybe you can think about something which you can put on your table but our detectors you know are huge and they are very complex and they have layers like onion i watched shrek yesterday so <laughs> and that's why there was this phrase about about onion and layers um and this is where you know experimental physicists are first of all trying to understand what really comes from these detectors and then when we disentangle all of this we try to uh sort of track it back to what happened uh during this collision so it's a you know complex things right complex from the moment you were uh you were producing your for example protons and then um, from your from your ion source, from your proton source, to the moment you you know accelerate them and really smash them against each other, it's a work of 
many, many, many people, uh, acceler accelerator physicists and experimental physicists and detector physicists and technicians and engineers, you know, lots of work. Yeah, lots of work. And let me just because you did share with me a couple images, um, like here you are. Uh, now, this could be, I see you have interesting stuff on the monitors there, but this could be yeah, it was... an office. It's not too different from other offices. <laughs> it's a bit messy office, right? I mean, this is um, this is how we work as experimental physicists in big collaborations. Um, so our detector is operating for a very, very long time during the year. Operator, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about the detector, but also accelerator and this, we collect our data for a long period of time. With the smaller experiments, it can happen over, let's say, several weeks or months during the year. Uh, in rig, I mean, it also depends, but it's sometimes, for example, like like eight months during the year. So, you know, we have to make sure we, as our whole collaboration, that everything works properly. And there always have to be someone, you know, during the whole day, during this 24 hours uh, of the day to... Uh, check if everything is working properly to make sure that uh, we are collecting good quality data. And how it looks in practice, as you could see on this picture, is that um, during the year, you as a part of the collaboration go to a experimental uh, shift, so-called, uh, and you are spending eight hours or nine hours of your life, depending here. I'm after the night shift. You can see how tired I am and, you know, <laughs> with my gym clothes, it, just to make it, you know, comfortable. Um, you are, you are there and you are, um, you know, you have different roles. Of course, there is a shift leader who is saying, you know, who is responsible for communication with the accelerator people. There are people who are responsible for um, detectors and checking if they are operating in the proper way. They are always also experts on the call. So if something particular is happening when detector experts cannot solve it because it's, for example, you know, too complicated or too unusual, uh, we have to call people to sometimes come to the control room or uh, to just tell us you know, what we should do, what should we fix. There are also people responsible for checking, you know, if the data is recorded properly. So all of this is just sitting in the room with, um, I don't know, maybe 20 monitors and, uh, you know, constantly checking if everything is working properly. So what you see here is me next to my, uh, not my, our, right, detector. So Your just detector. The scale. So you <laughs> yeah, I mean, our, right. <laughs> um, so you can see here the scale, for example, there is um, like a huge blue type of like cup right on the side. So this is the this is the side of the detector, um, which is able to detect the particles which are going, as we call it, a bit more forward. Right. So when you smash two particles, uh, they interact between each other, then we can talk a bit what's happening really when they are interacting, right? Um, and new particles are being produced. And uh, in some sort of uh, class of experiments, it's really important to look at the particles which go, um, you know, more in the center, but especially this, this, um, this part which is interesting for us is what's happening when they are going a bit more to the front, then we are able to probe a bit more extremal conditions, you can think about it in this way, um, of this what's happening inside. Yeah. So it's really a huge, uh, huge device. And in CERN, you know, my colleagues, like uh, particle physicists, they are ha having, you know, even larger detectors. So of course, it's it's really, um, it's really cool when you go there and you feel like a yeah. child, you know, in a toy store. <laughs> yeah, Do you, you must, you really like going to work, don't you? I do. I mean, every day, of course, I'm not working directly um, at my detector. We usually go there for a couple of weeks per year. Uh, if we are working with developing new detectors, then we are working uh, in smaller, smaller labs, uh, just testing a few things. Uh, then from time to time, I mean, time to time can be like, you know, once per five or 10 years or 15 <laughs> years, depending on the scale of the detector when we are building a new detector facility. Um, then of course the 
big assembly is happening and all these huge detectors are being built in different institutions all over the world. Uh, but, you know, the work of particle physicists from day to day is, um, at, at least me, is just going to my work and uh, trying to make sense out of this data, which was recorded for uh, several months right. over the year and trying to, you know, sort of translate all the signals which we see uh, to something meaningful, to something yeah. physical, like energies or angles or, or you know, things which are measured um, and we want to measure and we want to sort of translate them to this what's happening uh, during the collision. So, I mean, since we're, since we're talking about it, um, I guess here's an image you sent me. You sent me a couple things that represent the kind of data. Like this is this. What what are we seeing here? <laughs> okay, so um, here you can see a cross section of our detector. So as I told you, we are smashing particles, right? So actually, this is a picture of uh, one of the heavy ion collisions because these collisions are even more messy. So as you can imagine, you know, we kind of know probably what proton is or at least we sort of you know remember it maybe from school right from like chemistry classes we think about hydrogen atom we have like a one proton in the center and then we have one one electron sort of in a cloud right like running around it um so as i said we have two different uh possibilities at at our accelerator so we can smash protons or we can smash also actually three possibilities. We can smash heavy ions. So for example, gold, gold, or we can smash um, protons with heavy ions. Uh, so what we see and there- And when you say so, so a proton mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is so much smaller than, than an entire gold ion, because that's an entire gold atom that's just missing um, electrons, one yeah. or more. Is it missing it's, electrons or is it missing protons? No, no, it's it's we are stripping electrons, so we can they are then not uh, they are not neutral in charge sense, and then we can accelerate them. So we need ions. We need to ionize this um, these atoms of gold. So those are um, many, many, many times heavier than just a, a proton or a stream of protons. That is true. That is true. That's why it's also so interesting, right? So my colleagues who are working with uh, heavy ion collisions, they are producing some sort of, uh, you can think about the state of matter, which is called quark gluon plasma. So I think about that often. So <laughs> <laughs> you can, um, this, this is sort of a matter or, you know, the substance, if you can think in this way, uh, which was sort of, uh, they are reproducing how the universe looked just very, very tiny, you know, times just after the Big Bang, when everything was hot, uh, and I mean, so hot and so energetic that these atoms couldn't be yet created. Um, or, you know, that, uh, that protons were not protons yet. We were just having a sort of environment full of, of this what's inside the protons, so quarks and gluons. So this is why my colleagues are smashing this with heavy ions because we have lots of protons together and lots of quarks and lots of gluons so we can really achieve very high temperatures with these high energies uh, so what we can see here is that when we smash these particles protons or heavy ions um what, what's what's happening in the end is that you know after they interact between each other for a very very uh, short time uh they what what's happening is so called that they are hadronizing what does it mean is that the new particles are being produced and there is abundance of particles. Why it's happening? I mean, we have lots of lots of energies, energy, sorry, available in, in this interaction. And from this energy, new particles can be produced. Uh, so as you could see here, every single blue line or red line, which we can see here, is a track. Uh, it's a sign that there was a particle which was flying from the collision from the center to the you know um, rim of our detector through uh, through the detector which can actually uh, track this this paths of the particles. So this is just of course a sort of um, 
you know, representation where these particles were. We don't see any, you know, blue lines in Can our... Can I ask you, is this, <laughs> in our is this a compilation yeah. or is this the result of one collision? Hmm. This is the one collision. This is the one collision which is happening. And then imagine that then in your detector, so, you know, when you look at this picture, uh, you are facing sort of the detector, you are facing the beam. So the beam will come, you know, from uh, from you to the your monitor and from the other side, and they are smashing in the middle. And this is just a cross section in in the uh, plane of your of your monitor. Right, because so you this can is going on in three hundred and sixty degrees, completely spherical. Right, right. And this is right, just a right. cross section. That's a lot of paths. From you know, I'm used to seeing uh, people might have seen images of old, of cloud chambers where you get to see individual tracks, uh, two, three, four tracks that represent the path of one particle. And here is just countless. I guess it's already been interpreted to some degree so that you so that it's been color coded, right? Like right, that right. had so to be like an interpretation. Code, yeah, yeah, yeah. There can be yeah. It depends also, you know, about how what's momentum of these particles, you know, how fast they fly and how, what energy they have. Um, and also, you know, then then we are trying also to register the angles of of these particles. But you can imagine, you know, how much work it is, and how much you know achievement of all of my colleagues to really be able to disentangle all these single <laughs> particles to measure them very precisely, right? Um, and also, sort of, you know, uh, understand all the biases which we have, right? When they sort of merge together or, you know, just when you look at this picture, right? You, you barely can um, distinguish one track from, from another. Um, and, you know, and my colleagues in all this mess of, of, of the, um, as we call it, event, right? So when the particles are smashing, I say also oh, event happen, uh, are trying, you know, to see some patterns to understand how, re what are really the properties uh, of this uh, quark gluon plasma and something Maria, you know yeah. similar we do with the protons also right so we also right. smash them and we also look at this what's what sort of uh what we have out of this collision if this were just a proton proton collision would there be a lot fewer mm. lines um it it depends there's it still depends. a I lot mean, it will be fewer it will be fewer but it'll be still a lot right. so i want how like I, I wanted. I'm, I'm. I know that every question I ask could lead to answers that are too complex for me to follow. But I'm kind of curious how we get the image. Like, like a cloud chamber. They actually take photographs, very fast photographs, I guess. So, so what happens here? Things are you're accelerating particles to cl streams of particles to close the speed of light, smashing them together. As you said, the interaction is really brief and then there's this that happens that must be extraordinarily brief so it's not like a kodak camera that's snapping it how do you get a snapshot that 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 shows this can you for the lay person so these are convey yes, something about yes, that of course so there is um you know it's not only this tracks we are registering by far more so in general this is why we have all these detectors right uh so they all work for a bit different purpose and they all use in some way the interaction of these particles with matter so you know there's several things which we have to measure from the moment really we have collision to when the particles just escape somewhere uh, to our detector and they're registered there so we want to measure of course the angles of this of these particles or where where they go we want to measure generally the angles and energies to have like full kinematic information about about this particle to be able sort of think about it uh to describe it fully to have full full information about it and then maybe also identify it know if this particle was um you know a there are different types of particles if this particle was for example a meson we can call it this way if the particular mass etc so it's all you know it, we work like a small I don't know, detectives, right? We have tracks and we have to, based on these tracks, sort of say what particle it was. So it's fun. Um, so for example, if we have a charged particle like um, electron or like a 
some types of uh, muons. Muons are also special types of particles. Uh, when they travel through um, gas, like for example, in um, time projection chambers and or chambers which are filled with gas. It's sort of similar to this, what you said about the, you were mentioning, I think the- uh, Cloud chamber? Bubble chamber? Bubble yeah. chambers, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. When they are, you know, traveling through it, they are ionizing the gas which is inside. So what we are doing, we are sort of translating uh, this, you know, where it happened and this ionized uh, gas into electric signals. And these electric signals can be read by our electronics. And then based on it, um, I mean, I'm talking like a very, very, you know, simplification of this, what's happening, but based on it, we can, you know, track back where our track, where our particle, right, was crossing uh, through this detector. So you can say, okay, we have, we no, more or less know where the particle goes, but why we even want to, wanna, you know, know it, right? So all our detectors are in magnetic field. And what's happening with charged particles in the magnetic field is that they are curved. And when they are curved from this curvature, we can, um, and, and when we know the strength of this magnetic field, when we have charged particle, we can calculate the momentum the particle had. So, you know, it's all indirect. Okay, but we can already say. Right, that curve is going to vary based on. Well, what, what the strength of the magnetic field, how yeah, charged moment, the particle yes. is, and how massive the particle is, all those mm, things. How, and how, right, what was yeah. the momentum of this particle, right? Okay. Uh, we don't know how massive it was. The mass can has to be sort of, um, to, to guess the mass of the particle, we have to, again, sort of combine this information with the information from other detectors. For example, from the detectors which measure uh, the time when the particle was flying from the interaction point to some detector and having already momentum measured in this time, we can measure a mass. Um, so it's, you know, one big puzzle. And mm -hmm. it's, it's sort of, you know, you, you really are like a detective because if you say, for example, okay, I have a particle which has a signal in my tracker. So this detector, you know, which measures, measures the tracks, right, of the particles. Uh, you already know that this particle was charged. So, uh, you know, you have some class of particles which you sort of leave outside. Then you measure, for example, interaction of this particle in the detectors called calorimeters, uh, which are, for example, made out of special type of crystals. And they are losing, you know, this part the charged particles are losing some energy there. And sort of the way, the shape, how these particles are losing the energy there also can tell you if this particle was, for example, an electron or a photon, or it was um, some different particle, like, for example, this meson, which I was, which I was mentioning. Mm -hmm. So in the end, it's just, you know, several different, I'm just, you know, really brushing the topic. There's several different detectors, which can, um, which, I mean, you sort of collect all this information together and say, okay, this particle was most probably a neutral particle, which, you know, registered this particular energy in my calorimeter, which means most probably it was a photon, right? And this is the way based on all the signals from all the detector, you were able to identify the particles which escaped this collision. And then another fun starts because there can be some other particles which were produced in this collision and they decayed to other particles. So you have to reconstruct them back. Um, and on top of that, you have, you know, you measure something, you measure some particular observables, um, some processes, and then uh, you can learn a bit more what happened really on this, the most fundamental level, when this most fundamental pieces of matter were interacting between each other. So, as I said, it's a work of a, a particle detectives, you know, yeah. trying to track back what happened there. But can you sort of summarize what, so what does it all mean? Like what, like, okay, so that's what you're doing, but what's like the why? Like okay. what, what are, what's, what's an, and I know that some of the questions you want to answer are probably difficult for me to understand but um 
again, like what's, what are you really after uh, in all of that? All right. So y you can smash these particles for different reasons. And, you know, um, I was just, when I was starting uh, chatting with you here, I was telling you that, oh, they are like nuclear physicists and particle physicists, and there's this sort of division and people, um, you know, sometimes are confused why, right? Like what, what is going on? And I, I think, you know, that we are sort of dri all driven by trying to understand this most fundamental world of particle. But what I'm looking into is what is actually sitting inside the proton and how the proton, so this particle which sort of builds all of us. And it's so, it's not fundamental in the sense it has internal structure, but it's so fundamental for our, you know, existence in this sense, right? How, how it looks inside. So when you, you now smash, for example, two protons, what you're doing in reality is actually smashing a two very like complex systems, quantum mechanical complex system, which has very complicated dynamic internal structure with each other. Uh, so, yeah. So, so, so what you do actually, you, you <laughs> allow for the interaction between these components, right, of, of proton. So um, it, sometimes people, you know, think about like smashing particles, like, um, I don't know, smashing two cars, right? Which is uh, not, or, or I don't know, trains, right? Which are just, you know, on the same track and somehow we're just smashing them uh, together. But it's a bit uh, maybe counterintuitive, right? Because we are just, we, we are indeed smashing it, but simply all this energy, which is, which is there, which is in this collision, allows for producing sort of new particles, right? So out of, you know, smashing two trains, you can think that the, um, I don't know, jumbo jet was produced, right? It's sort of very weird thing which is happening. And then this plane is, uh, you know, decaying to two cars or something like this. Um, so, you know, we are, we are, what we are doing, we're just allowing for the interaction with very high energies of this very, like fundamental particles which sit inside the proton and and thanks to and thanks to it we can probe the interactions between them how they are binding them and what's right. actually inside what's the structure of well of, you know the proton. you've made some references to inside the proton and suddenly i feel like there's like a membrane and then there's some then there's a and it's like a bag of beads or something there's a bag of little balls inside <laughs> you you've talked about how complex the internal structure is but i think you know to a lot of people you know the atom was supposed to be the indivisible unit and then it turned out oh there's protons and and neutrons and electrons which clearly just go around like planets in the solar system, I'm kidding. Um, but but that model, and then the proton, if people know more than that, they might know that, oh, well, protons are made of quarks, and like three quarks. Um, so what is this complex structure you speak of? Is right. this, yeah, yeah. <laughs> is of course artistic Are there not, is it right? not just three it. quarks that are, held together somehow with some kind of glue so you know people it, it you know right now we know a bit better how proton looks inside but of course you know in science it's not like that you have a textbook right you read about something and you know it right you are sort of discovering new things so of course everything i'm saying right now comes from some measurements and from the theory which is describing it so you know it, it's not that we simply know that it looks like this, we measure it, right? We probe it. So you started from, from the statement that in the end, uh, we, there's often this understanding that proton is just like freak works. And this is coming from the fact that it really depends, you know, how precisely we can measure it, what's inside the proton. Uh, um, you can think about it a bit like a resolution of your microscope, right? If you're looking at something and you look with your eye, like, I don't know, on my phone, right? I don't see all atoms inside uh, because I'm, you know, my resolution is just resolution of my eyes. I cannot do much more on my glasses, right? Um, 
but then when we go deeper 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 and deeper we can see a structure of it right so something similar you can think about uh it is about all this story that proton is just free quarks right so what we do i told we are probing the uh proton structure with a beam of other particles we can do it with the beam of electrons or we can do it with the beam of other protons we are mostly here concentrating with our you know chat about two protons so, you know, when you smash it with some energy, which is not uh, high enough, your resolution will be only good enough to see sort of this three main quarks, which are inside, right? But the higher resolution you have, the higher energy you have, the, you know, the, the higher energy you have to smash these protons together or smash protons with electron beams, the sort of deeper and deeper and more complex structure you see. Simply, it's a matter of uh, resolution. So with the current um, resolution and also sort of understanding of the uh, forces which are driving, uh, you know, these complex systems and how really these components of proton are bind together, uh, with really a years of development of new uh, measurements and understanding better the theory of these strong interactions because this is how the how um, how the uh, the components of protons are bind together by so-called so, so strong interactions. It's a type of interactions in, in our nature. Um, what we know is that proton is really a dynamic system. It's not only, you know, free quarks. No, it's, so it's, it's more uh, like 25, it looks like. It's about 25 quarks. <laughs> it's, it's, no, it's, it's really, really, really a lot, right? So what's happening is that this is, of course, just a representation. And as I said, the deeper you go, the more you see. Um, and um, what, what do we understand now? That indeed we have this three sort of main quarks, which are there. Net quarks, you can see in this way. Um, but of course, the interaction between these quarks is governed by, I said, this strong force. And in the quantum field theory, so it's sort of the theory which is describing the interaction, the quantum theory which is describing the interactions, uh, the interactions are sort of carried by uh, a particle or particles. Um, and in this case, this particle, which is uh, carrying the strong interaction, is called gluon. It's, it's called in a funny way, right? Because gluon is like gluing it gluing things together. So, you know, on top of these quarks, we have also gluons, which are there. But uh, even more like fun thing is that inside the proton, we also have a um, actually different quarks because these three main quarks are up and down quarks. But we can have, um, first of all, sort of a spontaneously produced for a very, very tiny short period of time, a pair of quark and antiquark. An antiquark is a antimatter equivalent of a quark. So um, what's happening is that they can pop up out of vacuum, just like this, for a very, very short time, and then annihilate. And uh, it, they, they are so-called you know, like spontaneously, spontaneously pop, popping up there, they're spontaneously produced there. Uh, and what, what's happening is that the gluon, which is there, it's sort of splitting for quark and antiquark, and it's also represented here. And the gluons are represented by this, um, by this the springs, yellow? like yellow yeah. springs. Yes. And then you see this, this uh, quarks and antiquarks. So you know they are popping up and disappearing, and everything is so dynamic. There is, you know, zillions of them, and they are all interacting between each other, and they are popping up and, and I mean, disappearing, annihilating, right? They're annihilating and an energy is again produced. Um, so it, I'm, I'm, I know, I was, I think when we were chatting in, in, in Dao, I said, you know, the, the proton is a mess because, <laughs> um, you know, it's also, you know, it's full of this uh, particle. When we look from outside, maybe because, oh, you know, it's empty, we cannot see anything, but it's like a, it's like a gas, right? Like when you put it inside a balloon, it starts like ex expanding, right? Um, so everything is so dynamic, and these quarks are popping up and disappearing, and and the gluons are, you know, interacting with quarks and with other gluons, and everything is, uh, is you know, almost moving with the with the speed of light on a very tiny distances. So this can happen 
in this kind of complex systems when uh, particles are very close to each other because they are almost, um, this is sort of a feature of the strong interactions, that when the particles which are interacting strongly are sort of close to each other or they are the very high energies, they are, we say that they are asymptotically free, meaning that they are almost free. Um, so, you know, the str strong interaction is like, um, is like a rubber band, right? Um, when you can think of it, analogy, right? So when you pull it, it's harder and harder to pull it apart, right? But when you have it very close to each other, you can almost, you know, you can almost freely move this, this particles. So with all these experiments, you know, of smashing protons into protons and smashing electrons or, or other muons, muons are like heavier cousins of electrons, uh, we can probe the interior of the proton through different interactions. So when we smash protons with protons, probe the interior of the proton through the uh, strong interactions. So we're sensitive to gluons, for example, also to quarks, which are interacting strongly. But when we are, for example, smashing electrons with protons, then we are uh, sensitive uh, mostly to a electromagnetic uh, structure inside. Um, namely, we can probe uh, very precisely mostly mostly uh, quarks because quarks are interacting, you know, electromagnetically uh, with uh, photons, with electrons through a photon. Uh, so you know, it's it's a sort of set of interactions and experiments which are very selective in this what we want to probe inside the proton yeah. i just want to you know sort of sort of stress it that it's not like a textbook right that we yeah, open it right. and we know already how things look we are just simply by i mean by years like slowly you know starting to to probe it step by step and start and and trying to understand um where we are and there's still lots of lots of open questions about you know it. speaking of i know that this is outside your specific work and even really your specific discipline, but there's been a lot of particle physics has been in the news with the Large Hadron Collider. Oh yeah, recently, and, right? And so, so I don't, I haven't even looked into it enough to understand what is something about. A, is it a, a W boson? That oh yeah. Um, so I can so yeah I can without, explain a let's bit. Let's not let's not go whew, so deep that, right, that I right. completely lose the thread, but. But just a flavor of what 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 did they do? Did they discover? Yeah, yeah, like it was like because I would think that from what okay. you were just saying uh, okay. that, that in that in the debris of something, there's a lot of stuff you expect to see, and you see all that, and then you're looking for other stuff that, like you said, it's not in the textbooks. We don't know what else, but there's some stuff you expect, and then there's the unexpected or the unknown. Right. So what's happening here? Um, so my colleagues, you know, from uh, actually experiment, which is neighboring Argon. So Fermilab is a uh, different national lab, which is maybe, I don't know, like 10 miles from here, maybe 15. Yeah. I don't know, uh, 20 minutes driving about from Argon. Um, they are actually uh, measuring a bit diff you remember when I was talking about uh, gluons, which are carrying the strong interactions. So they are uh, actually very precisely measuring mass of a different particle, which is also carrying an, uh, in different type of interactions, so-called uh, weak interactions. We have strong and weak interactions, fun names, right, in physics. Right. So these interactions are generally uh, responsible of the fact, for example, that the nuclei can be in, uh, nucleus can be like uh, unstable. You know, beginning of 19th century, you remember uh, all the stories about uh, Marie Skłodowska Kiri and uh, Becquerel and all the you know discussion about the radioactivity. So these interactions are sort of driving um, the instabilities of, of uh, some of the nuclei. Um, so there is this, we call it boson, right? W boson, and it was everywhere on all covers. So what is, uh, what is happening is that uh, in particle physics, we often, or we try to look into things which sort of do not agree with the current, um, current theory, which is describing um, in the best way possible as of now, um, our particle physics and interaction between particles. The standard model. So what, 
yeah, the standard model of particles, so-called. And um, what, uh, what was done in this experiment, people were measuring very precisely um, uh, the mass of this uh, so-called W boson. Uh, so it's sort of, it, you know, this particle is not, you know, exotic in this sense. It's not particle which is not predicted by the standard model, but sort of there's a class of the experiment where you measure things very, very, very precisely. And then you check also on the other hand, like a prediction of this very, very precise measurement from this theory of standard model. Uh, so what happened is that from the data I you know collected for many years, 10 years, uh, my particle uh, physics colleagues were measuring very precisely the mass of this W boson. And it occurred that the uh, prediction which we have from the standard model and the measurement which was performed in the CDF experiment are, are um, far away from each other. I mean, maybe in the number, it doesn't look that far away, but uh, what was achieved in this experiment is the extremal precision of measurement of this mass. So sometimes in the literature, you can you can uh, find the name that these are like precision measurements. When you measure something super, super, super precisely to be able to test these predictions, for example, of the standard model. Um, so yeah, this was the big thing because people are just like, what is going on, right? Is it a sign of um, physics, as we say, beyond standard model? You know, everyone is looking for it. Everyone is like, we know that the standard model is not fully right. We cannot, A, incorporate gravity into it. We cannot, uh, you know, there are some things which we observe, which sort of... We, you know, we, we know that it doesn't work in some places, but we still do not have like a very clear um, sign of this. And we don't know sort of in which direction we should extend it. So people are very, very excited. Because about I it. would say that in a lot of areas of life, if you have like a, a cherished theory, which like the standard model, which has been built up over decades and hundreds right. of years, the whole thrust of physics, uh, culminates in this model and then you find something that contradicts it for a lot of kinds of people that's a terrible thing but for scientists <laughs> it's like oh yeah it's it's an exciting thing because you're look that's really you're looking for those kind of problems aren't you like, exactly exactly so in our case we are really uh you know in particle physics people are really searching for for these things which are out of ordinary and they are you know lots of different uh theories which are trying to sort of um predict or extend this standard model of particles so you know all this all this business with w boson is sort of you know there are three options right why it can happen so you can say of course the one thing is that you know one can say oh maybe the calculations are wrong right maybe the standard model calculations do not work i think that we are fairly sure that these calculations are are proper um you know there is several like proven uh you know different observables which show that that they they should be all right that everything should be okay um but you know one can ask maybe maybe right. there is something wrong there the other thinking can be, okay, maybe something is off uh, in the measurement. So, of course, you know, all the like experimental community um, is also thinking maybe, you know, there is some with something, you know, something not particularly uh, taken into account into the measurement or, or so. This can also be a possibility. But, of course, this most exciting possibility is that, indeed, this is as it is. And um, we have this discrepancy between the measurement, very precise measurement, and the theory. And we right now have to understand why. And uh, you know that, that, that's right. that's the best that's the best part. There's more data. Um, I'm I'm pretty sure that um, you know lots of experimentalists will be looking very precisely into the measurement. Lots of theories will be right now trying to understand this discrepancy. Um, and there are more data to come. 
there are more data from yeah. the uh, but I like large that idea Hadron that's, Collider, right? That, that discrepancies like this, problems where the prediction, the measurement doesn't match the prediction, uh, rather than being negative things, there are these, because they're a place where the scientists can get a hold, go, okay, here's where we should focus our energies, so to speak, to, to look for new things. Um, there's something here and, uh, yeah. So, you know, let me ask you. Yeah, so it's you, always, you know, no, it's, some it's sort of stuff. brave. Just, what, yeah. oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> what were you going to say, though? No, I just wanted to say that it's sort of, uh, it's sometimes dangerous to be uh, biased in one or the other direction, right? Because if you have some prediction, uh, sometimes people tend to, uh, you know, when they have some measurement, they really want it to agree with the, with the prediction from the theory. Yeah. And that's why <laughs> lots of these analyses are done so-called like, uh, blind. We say that we have blind analysis, which means that we are till the very end. Experimentalists are not looking into final stage of the data, yeah. not to not to get biased. But it's very exciting. We don't know what's going on with this yeah. W boson, and uh, it's certainly uh, an open question. And I think everyone is looking anxiously to uh, understand a bit better, yeah. a bit better what what is going I, on. I mean. Um... Unless I'm confusing my stories, I think that Stephen Hawking famously, uh, he had a couple famous bets, like $1 bets. That was just the point. It wasn't the money. Um, and one was he was betting against the LHC finding the Higgs boson. He, he didn't wish them ill. <laughs> he didn't not want them to find <laughs> it. It's just that if they didn't find it, it would be a more interesting result because it would uh like point yeah the way. That, yeah so right, it was just kind of in right. fun with it. another it's like if they don't find it then things get interesting so let me ask you a little more broadly did you let's let, stepping back mm -hmm. did you always know that you wanted to be a scientist did you have any role models you you mentioned marie curie was she ever on your radar was that a any kind of influence or anything i think i i always was very curious um, but I was also Marie not curious. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I was sort of always interested in many things, and I think that. Um, but I li I liked always like riddles, and I like like intellectually challenging things. Um, and I think science, you know, is sort of ideal for it. If I always want to be a scientist, I don't think so. I, I mean, as a kid, I was thinking that I will be a teacher. And uh, I remember when I was a, when I was a small kid, I was coming back home from my kindergarten, and I was having like plush toys, you know, and I was like uh, sort of arranging them in a classroom, which was just my my room, and I was teaching some basic things on the blackboard. I asked my parents, "I want a blackboard and chalk, and I want to just uh, you know uh, do different things." But I also I, I liked I liked puzzles and riddles, and uh, from this really in high school, I had a very good physics teacher who was sort of allowing us to think a bit outside of the box. You know, we we were challenged to interpret uh, the experiments we could see in a way to really kind of deduce things which are happening there uh it was challenging it was something different than maybe other classes where as i said right you open a textbook and you sort of read and then uh you are not challenged to understand maybe really what's happening uh inside but this sort of you know sparked my interest um and and you know, like somehow it just I, just, I I went to my university. I started studying physics because I thought, yeah, maybe I would teach physics. Maybe I would be like my like my teacher. But then, so so slowly, slowly, after second years of my studies, I had this amazing chance to uh, go to I mean to have my internships in here in the U.S. As I said, I mentioned Fermilab. I was there, uh, you know, during summer of 2010, I think. Uh, and I was completely, you know, hooked by this environment. I loved my supervisor there. I loved this environment of international people working together, uh, you know, scientists, students, uh, engineers, um, you know, all the lectures which were happening there. It's not that I understand everything from there and I was lost very often, but it was so <laughs> like vibrant. 
and uh, so much fun that slowly, you know, this dream of becoming a teacher sort of shifted into a dream of becoming a scientist. So it slowly nice. evolved. It's not that everyone who is a scientist, you know, dreamed as a three-year-old kid to be a scientist. Right. It, it slowly sort of changed. You know, interestingly, we mentioned that, uh, that when I met you, you were a postdoc at Berkeley, and we have a comment from Berkeley Lab that says, great to see this happening. <laughs> um, oh, so that's it's so if, sweet. Yeah, and if they turn, tuned in late, we, 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 we mentioned Berkeley earlier. What were you doing there? <laughs> was it basically the same kind of work? Were you, 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 oh, were, actually, studying, so you were interested here, in the proton? Yeah. Right, right. So here I'm sort of extending on this, what I started doing. So I joined STAR, this experiment, when I was in Berkeley, I, when I was a postdoc there. I also worked a lot there work. I mean, I was sort of, it, it, it was a part of my mission there to work for other postdocs. I was a part of the postdoc association. So all this, um, all this sort of interest, I was always interested in sort of spin physics. I didn't mention much of it here. It's, you know, sort of uh, another thing which we are, which we are trying to understand inside the proton was the spin I guess it's not much related proton. to spin classes. Right. <laughs> um, right. And, um, you know, I, everything sort of started there. And right now here, when I moved to Argonne, I have, you know, my far more responsibilities. I, uh, work also, I started working with a different experiment, which is probing the proton structure with electrons, which I was mentioning. So it's another national lab experiment in, uh, Virginia in Jefferson lab. Uh, and I also work towards a new experiment, which um, is planned uh, in Brookhaven National Lab. And this experiment will aim also for um, for probing the internal structure of the proton as well as ions uh, with electron beams, uh, you know, also in this kind of collider mode when we are smashing them together. So, yeah. you know, from Berkeley to here, it's sort of a uh, progress and uh, and sort of uh, getting deeper and deeper in all of this and, and sort of getting more responsibilities and sort of also shaping this story and shaping, you know, the future experiments. This is very, very exciting. Is there a question that you most want the answer to, a question that I would even understand? <laughs> I know I keep saying there that, but you understand. There's many you questions. Were, yeah. There's many of them. It's it's so scary that it's so many of them. And of course, you know, as, as we as whole, as a, in, in a community, I think we are all, of course, looking into um, what's beyond the standard model. Um, you know, and, and this is somewhere there. It's, of course, you know, uh, it's driving lots of lots of physicists. What's, what's driving me is to look you know, in this, what we sort of think that we know, uh, all this business with strong interactions, which are binding quarks and, and gluons together, um, and to sort of really understand how the properties and internal structure of the proton is sort of, you know, arising and it's driven uh, by the strong interactions. It's a very, very um, complex and difficult question because it's not only, you know, to understand how the proton looks inside, but also why. And of course, this why is sort of, you know, for sure beyond just my comprehension. And it's, you know, it will be a work of several, um, several theorists, uh, computer scientists, experimentalists. So it, it's sort of a general question, which I know will be, you know, brought by a huge number of physicists. And I'm so excited about it because, you know, we, it, it looks like really we, we move towards also understanding, you know, this basic matter, which, which builds us all. People sometimes think that it's sort of boring, that this is like a Oh, it's like, I don't know, parameter we're just plugging in to, to our calculations because, or, you know, or we want to just understand better what we are smashing to produce new particles with, with you know, which are showing the signs of beyond standard model, etc. But I still think that, you know, there's so many open questions to so understanding such a basic thing. You know, such a basic particle, which sort of builds me, you and the, and the whole world. Um, 
and it's you know so complex dynamic and um you know driven by such a you know weird quantum mechanical uh interactions it it's um it's maybe you know very sort of trivial what i'm saying but i think that the sort of very basic and fundamental questions are like the most interesting because we simply it is like that but we do know know why we so we try to understand you know how the proton looks inside but also with help of of our colleagues theorists also also really why and this why is um is i think the quintessential part uh, of all these new experiments which are sort of right uh, plan you know in the future. You, you're talking here a little bit about the interplay between theorists and experimentalists mm -hmm. like yourself um, and it's really interesting how science sometimes, uh, you know, some discoveries originate with theorists and later the experimentalists verify like the Higgs boson, but other times maybe the experimentalists notice something and then you got to ask the theorists, well, why is it like this? Right. Um, right. Right. So, so there's it's so like, much for example, with the, all the, all the stories with the spin structure, of the proton as i said we didn't much spin much but you know it's it's often that uh we measure something and it's not at all as we thought it is and we predicted it and then you know lots of uh theorists are working with us together and trying to uh to really understand what is going on so it's really like an interplay it's a yeah. uh, collective work of a huge community so much collaboration people. and right speaking of let me ask you a little bit. You know, we met three years ago at the Lindau Nobel Laureate meeting in Germany, and you you were uh, a postdoc at Berkeley, and and I interviewed you there, and um, that's like a five day event, and it's really interesting and fun. I have my own perspective. I'm not an attending Nobel Laureate or young scientist. I wonder now, three years out. What has that experience, like, can you put that into context? So um, I haven't talked to many of the people I met there three years later to ask what did that meeting and what did that event mean uh, to your career or you personally, now that you have this sort of context I think it was a, later. right, it was a, um, I mean, one of, I think, most important meetings, conferences in my life. Um, you know, it it's. I think it sort of shapes you as a scientist to some extent. It's just a very short meeting, so you, um, of course, you know, it's it's not like a long term mentorship, right? Which can really shape your career fully. But it was such a interesting experience to first of all with meet with all early career scientists who are there and you know i had great connection with a couple of people we are still um sort of interacting after the meeting um we had our own initiative regarding you know inclusivity of the meetings and we met all together with uh with a group of people who are sort of dedicated to it and we prepared uh a sort of you know our list of suggestions which we think can can kind of help to make this community more inclusive and we shared it with uh, Lindau Nobel Foundation and they um they uh were very you know it, it, it was very nice that we sort of had sort a dialogue with them and I remember they published I think our open letter on their blog so it was sort of an initiative which started there but um uh, still continued after um Excellent. it sounds like it fits then, right in with you know there's the, the, something that's been developing these past several years also the lindau guidelines which right for example uh, they they yeah. they incorporate other things too like like open access and open science and but exactly but inclusivity is a is a is a big part of like the 10 guidelines that they'd like to see right right uh more and widely it was adopted. great because you know in 20 um 2020, I think the year after uh, after the Lindau meeting I was participating in, um, the meeting went online, of course, because of the pandemic situation. 
and um, we had the chance to participate again online in this event, which is usually not happening that you can participate twice unless you won a Nobel Prize, right? As everyone is joking <laughs> right. at this meeting. Um, and or unless a you're a science initiative. comedian, it turns out. Right. Okay. But you know, you have a special treatment. <laughs> but I don't so get to participate doesn't... in quite the same way as you, but I get to be there. <laughs> right. But um, they, they organized sort of um, like a hackathon. It's, well, it was called Sciathon, where we were working for the three exactly. days. exactly. Right. Three days. We were working on sort of developing ideas which help... Um, you know, bringing to life this, uh, I think 10, I, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm wrong, but there, there are the science um, um, guidelines, sorry, it's called, it's called Lindau guidelines, right? Where we have several, several ideas about the openness of science and uh, how the, how to improve, you know, repro reproducibility, communication of science and, and several, it, it touches, they are touching on very, very different topics, which are important for the general scientific community and it was so much fun we we're working in the group yeah. of i think 10 scientists um all day all night preparing you know like our our uh paper and video um about you know our idea and it was so nice to reconnect yeah. with with all these people and also new uh early career scientists which were there and i think it's a really really great initiative and i'm so happy that this year uh they are back in person, right? Yeah. So, you know what? I uh, uh, want to say hi to Regina, who said hello. And also, Aaron Freeman said decades ago, Murray Gelman said, quarks exist, that experimentalists have not found them is not my problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, so he's a yeah, theorist, apparently. Um, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I think that, you know... Um, over the years, I think that this interaction between theorists and experimentalists uh, really shown to be essential, right? Yeah. And as you know, you cannot win a Nobel Prize with the theory which is not confirmed by the experiment, ah, right? There you go. <laughs> so, so, of course, everything has to be, it's science, right? We want to yeah. see the proof that things uh, exist know, or don't. Aaron also asked, why do some people think the standard model is wrong? And Aaron, we actually already kind of talked about this. But it's not even that they think it's wrong. It's that they know that it's know not that complete. there has to be something, right? Right. That it's it's not wrong in the sense, um, right? I, you know, sometimes wrong means that it really doesn't describe the reality. It does. It does to the extent, um, you, you know, with the energies we can probe, and it it describes it in the excellent way, right? It's just that we know that it has to be uh, something beyond. Standard model has problems, as I mentioned already, that it, it doesn't know how to incorporate the fourth um, force in the nature, namely uh, gravity. gravity. Uh, we, we are able to you know, describe and incorporate the electromagnetic interactions, so-called weak interactions, which we're, we were mentioning you know, regarding this W boson, and the strong interactions, which are binding things together. Um, so it, it's not that it's it's wrong. It, we just um, we just search for it extension, right? Yeah. It doesn't describe everything, and we want yeah. a theory which describes really everything. So it you yeah. know, describes what it describes. It describes very well, right? Right. But, but we are searching it's, for something. It's not a perfect it. analogy, but in the same way that Newton's theory of gravity turns out to be incomplete because it doesn't cover ex some extreme areas of conditions of right speed yeah. Here, or mass yeah. yeah yeah so but there's nothing wrong with the theory it just turned out that that it wasn't it's complete. not complete right yeah. right i right. like that so you know what which brings up a great point um maybe our last subject to to discuss because i've have kept kept you here captive for quite a long time. <laughs> but I'm, I'm talkative, I, sorry. <laughs> I know that you are really interested in science communication and here we are even doing it. Tell me why, do you feel like, do you just love to do it or do you feel obligated like it's a part of your job or, and, and, and what is it, what is it when it comes to science communication to the public, what is it that you want the public to know? Oh, you see, I think that science, I mean, I, I always repeat sort of that science communication is our obligation, but I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, it, 
I'm saying like this because I like doing it, right? So uh, <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm, it's, it's a bit of a joke. No, I mean, the point is that um, I think it's essential. And I think it's essential because, um, you know, we can build all this state of the art, you know, uh, detectors and we can um, work on all these revolutionary theories, right? But if we do not have uh, people who would like to continue it, right? And we also do not have society who really um, understands the need of uh, very basic research, then we won't be able to sort of continue pushing our knowledge, right? Pushing the border of our knowledge. Um, and I think that also science can be really fun. Um, and you know, science communication doesn't always have to sell science as a fun thing to do. Uh, it's it's sometimes complex, but it's uh, you know it's really bringing all these puzzles and riddles and and pushing our knowledge about the world. And I think it's in this regard, it's sort of uh, it's sort of essential. It's a very important part of me. Maybe it's just you know this teacher which uh, is somewhere there in the back of my hand. So yeah, I wanted to be a teacher and that's why I'm <laughs> trying, you know, to uh, get get involved. Um, and and it's very important for the community. And I think also, especially for like nuclear nuclear physics community to, to, to sort of bring it. Uh, I think that, you know, LHC and high energy physics do an excellent job in science communication, or, you know, they really see the, the reason of doing it. In nuclear physics, there's lots of very passionate people. Um, but, you know, how many times you see people are talking about nuclear structure or proton structure, uh, it's probably not that common, right? Um, so I think that all this, all this sort of, you know, communication and bringing and translating the research we are doing to... Um, you know, on a different levels, starting from kindergarten to, uh, you know, to people who are simply maybe interested in science, but are not scientists. Uh, it's extremely, extremely important. Exactly. Right. <laughs> so, you know, I just, I just, um, there's lots of excellent resources everywhere in the internet. And I think that more and more is happening in the field of nuclear physics. And I'm very, very happy. And it's sort of part of me. I will be not yeah. able to uh, to uh, work without it. Not everyone has to do it, but I think that, you know, if you can uh, and you find some time, please <laughs> support our community. We previously discussed how, like, I think when people hear nuclear physics, they think, oh, does you work on nuclear weapons or nuclear power? But those right, are right. applied uh, and you're you're in it for the pure stuff, aren't you? Right, right. So this is, you know, one of the things, right, when you think about nuclear physics, oh, yeah, it's for sure like, or nuclear energy, right, people think, or some applied things. So, of course, you know, that, that basic science, which is driving all of this, um, you know, it's, it's basically this what I do in my everyday life. But nuclear physics can be very, very fundamental, can be very, very basic, can really ask about the, the, the most basic questions about our universe. Um, so yeah, so this is sort of some of the miscommunications which are sometimes happening. It's like, oh, are you a nuclear physicist? Yeah, are you working the like power, like a uh, uh, power <laughs> station, right? Like you're right. producing? No, not really. <laughs> you, you may, speaking of miscommunication, are there any uh, miscommunications? Like, are there any um, myths or misunderstandings there that you think the public has, or? Or is there something that you wish the public better understood about your realm of science? Uh, sometimes, uh, I, mean, I think that there are lots of small things and it really, it depends also on which level you are explaining things to the public and it kind of ties back to the uh, science communication, right? Because, uh, I mean, we can take this simple example. I think we, we in, in one or your videos, um, you know, you're touching on it, like, for example, when you smash two uh, protons together, right? Sometimes how it is explained uh, is that you sort of smash them and you just uh, break them 
which you know uh and then people see okay so it's something hidden inside right that when you break it for example this w boson does this w boson sort of sit inside or how does it work so of course you know when you explain things um to sometimes i don't know kids in kindergarten right then you explain a bit different way and then you can sort of bring a complexity on it and say yeah what's happening is sort of you know uh interaction between the particles which really sit inside and then the energy uh from the you know famous equation of e equal mc uh, squared right uh, can be the energy can be converted into mass and the new particles can be produced and then you can even go one step further you know and sort of try to explain the quantum field theory and particles and waves etc so i think that um it, this sometimes is a bit of the you know misunderstanding regarding regarding how really particles are interacting uh in the accelerator um but i think it all depends or, or like i don't know we mentioned atoms and and nuclei and uh you know these electrons running around and i'm always like um yeah if you want to go very deep and we very be very precise I mean, we should, right? We should be always precise in the in the science communication, but also uh, the level of you know complexity which can which we can bring has to be always sort of uh, adjusted. Also, you know, many things are like, for example, like spin, right? People are explaining sp spin as like a rotating particle, right? Um, but sometimes, you know, I'm thinking, and I'm still sometimes not comprehending fully what spin is. Sometimes things are very complex, are quantum mechanical, are counterintuitive. And we are, you know, trying to sort of twist our head around right? <laughs> all of this and trying to to understand it, uh, understand it deeper. But sometimes it's even too complex, uh, too complex for us. And, yeah. and um, so, so it, it's a it's a really a challenge, right, to understand on the very very basic, very simple level and sort of translate it to the public. Well, Marie, I want to thank you for taking the time to talk to me. And Thank it's been so great much. to see you again three years later, and you're doing great, and uh, staff scientist at, at Argonne. Um, I guess I should uh, remind everybody that they can find you online at mariazurich.com, uh, but your Twitter handle is Maria K. Zurich. And um, yeah, this has been super fun catching up with you. And um, I'm going to say goodbye. Don't go away. I'll be right back. But uh, thanks for spending the, the morning with me. And thank you. Uh, yeah, for those of you watching, thank you very much. That is our show. Uh, check out Maria Zurich. And tomorrow, I'm doing something a little different. I'm going to have three guests. They're the producers of the new documentary, Science Friction, and comedian Matt Kirshen, who's in it, along with me. Um, and it's about science communication gone wrong. It's about a certain kind of uh, television programming. But science friction tomorrow. Our theme music is by Logan Whitehurst. Find him at loganwhitehurst.com and check out his Spotify artist page. And hopefully, see you tomorrow. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>